Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1980 release by John Carpenter, The Fog. And just so people know, if you're a John Carpenter fan, you want to see more John Carpenter reviews on my channel, there is actually a playlist that I started now because I did enough reviews at this point to have a John Carpenter film playlist. I also have one for Dario Argento and one for Lucio Fulci at the moment. And as, as I get more movies for other directors, um, I will do that as well. Create those new ones. So anyway... Let's tear into this affair. So up front, like I always say, I'm going to have spoilers for this. So if you've never seen The Fog, well, first of all, if you've never seen The Fog, shame on you. Uh, and if you've never seen The Fog, stop right now. Go watch it. It's available on Shudder for streaming. When I'm doing this review, uh, I do recommend it. So let's get into this. Written and directed by John Carpenter, but also written by Deborah Hill. Now, Deborah Hill has been a collaborator with John Carpenter. She worked on the script for Halloween and Halloween 2 with him. Um, and this came for John Carpenter when he was, it was after Halloween, it was bo before he did Escape from New York. And actually for John Carpenter, uh, Escape from New York and The Fog was a two film deal that he got from the studio. So um, I, I assume that uh, the fog actually instilled some good, um, some goodwill with the studio, and go, especially going into Escape from New York, because in the box office, the fog did well. The fog made, well, it cost one point one million dollars to actually make, and it made twenty one point three million dollars in the box office. And remember, this is nineteen eighty, and also that's only domestically, so they made good money. Now, reviews on it were very mixed, but. For the studios, what matters most, the money matters most. And the weird thing for me about the budgetary thing is it was $1.1 million for the film. They spent $3 million on marketing. How does that add up? I, I just don't understand that. That's just ridiculous to me. Spend more money on the film. Although, honestly, this film's so good the way Carpenter pulled it off. I just feel like I guess it didn't need the extra money. Although it would be cool to see what he could have done with that extra money. So anyway, um, Tom Atkins is in this one. If you don't know Tom Atkins, you're probably not super deep into um, horror genre culture. Uh, he was in some other things like he was actually in Escape from New York, which actually a lot of these, um, I'll tell you right up front, a bunch of these actors who were in The Fog ended up being in Escape from New York. Adrian Barbeau, Tom Atkins, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis actually had a very small role. She was like a, a just a voice in it, but still involved. Um, so Tom Atkins has also done Halloween 3, which he's probably most well-known for now, which is such a cult film. I think it's fun. Uh, it's not a good film. It's just fun. Uh, Night of the Creeps, which a lot of people also love him for, and Maniac Cop, uh, which I have not seen Maniac Cop, and I need to. Adrienne Barbeau is in this, obviously. She's been in a ton of stuff, but this came after, um, actually right before she was in Escape from New York, and Escape from New York kind of put her very much on the map. Um, and Jamie Lee Curtis, this was after Halloween, obviously she worked with Carpenter on that one, and the same year as Terror Train and Prom Night, so The Fog, Terror Train, and Prom Night for her in one year released, that's pretty cool. I've not actually seen Terror Train, that is another one that's on my list, I have a ton of films on my list to watch, but uh, it, I've seen Prom Night, I like Prom Night, Lo really like The Fog, so wow, Jamie Lee Curtis, man. So Carpenter was inspired by a visit that he took to Stonehenge with Deborah Hill for this film, and also a movie, I don't know about this movie, it's from the UK, it's called Trollenberg Terror, uh, apparently it's about monsters that hide in the clouds, which actually sounds kind of like Lovecraft-ish, in my opinion. Um, the story of deliberate wreckage of a ship and the plundering of the gold then was actually based on true events. Uh, Carpenter had found this account of that, this actually happening with what happens with the start of this, you know, coastal town in the film. So I thought that was cool that it was actually based in reality. You know, a lot of filmmakers will take from reality to, you know, build their scripts. Um, already talked about that. So Carpenter disliked his rough cut of the film and added the campfire story portion in the beginning and a bunch of other scenes um, 
and sequences to increase the scares and the gore factors because they be they became aware of the fact that they were going to be competing with a bunch of other horror films that were gory so they felt like oh well we need to up our gore too i'm glad they did that although i feel like they missed a, a one at least one good key opportunity which is where the um stevie wayne's kid his um granny of a babysitter when she just got nabbed and pulled into the fog and you hear the noises which was done well but that was the opportunity to like just show it because the weatherman got it and they showed it and i guess they were just like no spare the old lady <laughs> i guess that was their their idea but um i wish they hadn't because if you were looking to really up the gore factor that was a prime uh opportunity that you just passed on Oh, and I, I would argue that they did not need the opening sequence of that campfire story because, yeah, I understand that it, like, primes people for the actual story of what happens, but do we want that? Don't we want it to be more mysterious? Because think about the film without that portion, how things, like, gradually are introduced of, like, the, dr the driftwood and the fog and the pirates and, you know, everything. It just seems like... I mean, me personally, I would like more mystery to it. I would like to kind of figure out things as I go along because I found myself, as all these things were coming up, um, initially when I saw it, that's, this is not the first time I've seen it, um, but when all those things were coming up, I was just like, oh yeah, I remember the campfire story. This is all tied to that. And I just kind of feel like for me, it would have been better if I didn't know that and I was surprised at some point of, oh, this is a story. Because you kind of learn it through the journal entries that um, Father Malone was reading. So I think he's just left it that way. So there are a lot of name references in this film that Carpenter put in there. Uh, some having to do with his friends like Nick Castle. Uh, obviously Tam Tom Atkins character is named Castle. Uh, Tommy Lee Wallace is in there. The name Tommy Lee Wallace who worked on the film is in like production design and then ended up directing Halloween 3. Uh, and Dan O'Bannon who was a collaborator like writing collaborator on Dark Star with uh, Carpenter. Uh, his name's in there, but also names like Machin. Arthur Machin is an author, a horror author, and so it was, you know, a reference to that. But also the use of Dr. Phoebes, uh, which is a call to a character played by Vincent Price. But then also, if people didn't notice, Father Malone looks a lot like Edgar Allan Poe, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Also, he drinks quite a bit, so I think that was a further hint that he's supposed to look like and kind of represent Edgar Allan Poe in a way. So lots of references to people. Uh, apparently a novelization of this film actually came out in the same year that it was released, which, I don't know, I feel like novelizations usually come out after the fact, if it's based on the script in the film, um, but it, it looks like it came out about the same time, so it's like, oh, okay, that's kind of weird. Um, I wonder if anyone, anyone watching this, have you read that novelization? And if so, how is it? Put a comment down there. Although I'm sure most people haven't. And then obviously there's a remake of this film in 2005. Apparently not a lot of people liked it, which, you know, makes sense because the original's good. And that's one of the problems we get into with remakes is when the original's really good, how are you going to improve on that really? It's, it's very hard to do. So apparently on Rotten Tomatoes, it has like a crazy low score, the remake. So from what I hear, rightfully so. So they start this with an Edgar Allan Poe quote, which, you know, makes me believe even more than it's not a coincidence that Father Malone looks like Edgar Allan Poe. The quote is, is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream. In addition to rhyming, it's kind of cool, um, kind of questioning the reality of things just in life in general, but also within the film. So I like that. Not sure how I feel about the ghost story. Right. Oh, yeah, I was already talking about this. I kind of jumped ahead. Uh, just saying that I want to maintain that mystery. But I do also, I do think that the ghost story does help in setting up the mood for the film. And they have some really good music during the campfire that helps with setting up the mood. And in general, the music in this is really good and really matches what's going on. You know, I would expect nothing less from John Carpenter, and he always does a great job with matching music in his films. Um, so now with the actual events of the film. So by hearing the radio broadcast and being shown multiple buildings within, within the uh, town, uh, it gives you the idea. It, it's a visual way to tell you the whole town 
listens to this broadcast pretty much. Like everyone has their radios on pretty much all the time and they're all keyed into this one radio station that's local. Um, KAB, um, oh my gosh, Antonio Bay. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot it. I literally just watched it. I was like, how am I going to forget this right now? So um, the lack of music in certain parts really, really works. If you've watched enough of my reviews, you know that I love when a lack of music is used to great effect. And I think that was the case uh, in the beginning of it when they were using it for the uh, convenience store. When it's quiet and you hear the guy, it, it, like, it accentuates the other sounds of, of what's going on around the scene. Like the sweeping, um, the the jiggling of the mirror, the bottles when they start rattling because the fog is doing things to the town, um, when the sign breaks and is hanging down and creaking, like it increases those and it makes them creepier. And I, I just love it. it. It makes things more tense. And there's so much to be said when someone uses silence in a great way. Uh, you gotta love the blatant drinking and driving and unchecked trust in hitchhikers. And that's between Jamie Lee Curtis and Tom Atkins characters. Um, yeah, because Tom Atkins, drinking and driving, very blatantly, doesn't hide it. Not even when he picks up Jamie Lee Curtis, the hitchhiker, and he's just like, here, you want a drink with me? You know, I might be totally blitzed while driving. You don't know. And then they, like, have this back and forth of, like, making jokes about, is it okay to pick up a hitchhiker? Are you crazy? Am I crazy? Like, it's, um, a little bit disturbing, but, you know, this was a different time. You know, you can't do that now, uh, obviously, but then... Things were better back then, in a sense, so it makes sense in this film, looking back. Um, and then the fact that they just sleep with each other, but then I was just like, man, that's crazy. But we're just coming out of the 70s, you know, free love and all that. So, you know, I, I worked with a guy once who, um, he had a great time in the 70s, as he, as he told me. And he was like, man, you really missed out. I, you know, I feel sorry for you because the 70s were wild, man. Like, the free love thing was amazing. And I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, it's such a cool idea to have the radio station in the lighthouse. It looks awesome. The setup in there is super, super cool. It makes me want to have that job. Like, it's awesome. I actually had worked at a radio station before. Worked as in, like, I wasn't making money. I was an intern, um, actually, for WOXY, for, um, 97X, in Ohio, like 45 minutes north of Cincinnati in Miami, Ohio. Um, that's the radio station that's referenced in Rain Man, where he says, 97X, bam, the future of rock and roll. That was the last, like, holdout for independent radio for quite some time. It was a really cool station. And, you know, watching the fog just kind of made me think back to my times in 97X. It was, it was a cool place. Uh, the silhouettes of the pirates in the fog look really good. And also menacing, especially when you can see how they're holding their weapons. And it's not just, like, the swords. The swords look great because they look cool and they look old. But, but like, the meat hooks that they have are awesome. Those are the best, in my opinion. I love the meat hooks. I like the introduction of a large amount of characters, even if they don't focus a ton on all of them. Because it truly makes you feel like the whole town is involved in this. But it also shows you a lot of the town and helps immerse the audience in the town that way. Because you feel like you see all these different people. And so you're like jumping around. So you get more of an idea of the size of the town and how connected it is. But it also sets it up because then you have more potential fodder for killing. And then you don't know who's going to get it, who's not going to get it. So I like that. It's a good motivation for the fog coming in that the town was built basically on blood money from the shipwreck. I like that motivation. Uh, they just as easily could have made the film and been like, this fog just happens to show up and it kills people. Or there's just pirates in it because they're because pirates are bad and they just want to kill. But the fact that they have that motivation behind it is a cool tie-in. I quite like it. Literally, the town and the church was built on blood money. Uh, people were murdered, and the ship was intentionally wrecked in order to steal that money and start that town. So, yeah, I like that. The scene where the driftwood starts leaking, and then it says six must die on it, and then it bursts into flames is a really cool scene. It's potentially my favorite scene. I know that's kind of weird because it's a very small thing, but the way it looked and the way it played out, and especially on your first viewing of the film, how surprising and crazy that was, 
Really like it. Looked great. Loved it. They sure did generate a lot of fog for this movie. They really, really did. There's so much fog. I would be interested to know how much fog it was and how, how much of a pain that was to do and shoot it properly. But it looks good. I think every time they employ the fog, it looks really cool. Sometimes it looks white. Sometimes it looks blue. Sometimes it looks green. Um, so it's kind of cool that it actually changes in, in color as well. It's a great shot when the fog is rolling on, in onto the beach when Stevie Wayne is looking down from the from the lighthouse. Um, it's rolling in on the beach because the because it looks kind of green. The sky looks like reddish orange, and then the actual beach looks like a purplish blue. So, like from a color perspective, it looks very very aesthetically pleasing, and I just really like that shot. It looks awesome. Honestly, I would take like um, you know one of those printed canvases you can put on your wall i'd love one of that that would be amazing that probably exists somewhere on the internet and i might have to check that out <laughs> uh why didn't they show the old lady getting it yeah i already talked about this they showed the weatherman get it i this is one of my biggest problems with this film like you tried to up the gore after you saw the rough cut cut john carpenter why didn't you kill the old lady on screen this was your opportunity to up that gore even more <clears throat> should have done that it's a small thing though i found myself keeping track of the body count because of what the driftwood said it really sticks in your mind that six must die and i don't know if other people out there watching it you know had the same reaction where they're just like okay there's the first person to get it there's the second person to get it but then i actually forgot about the counting towards the end because <laughs> i got distracted by other things going on but for a while i was very focused on it it's a tough decision for Stevie Wayne to make to stay at the radio station instead of going to find her son. That is truly the sacrificial moment of, I have to do for the greater good. I have to sacrifice, potentially sacrifice my own son in order to save this town because I have the best vantage point. The weatherman's dead at this point, and I'm seeing where the fog is going, and we know that the fog is a problem. We know there's something in it that is killing people. So, good job, Stevie Wayne. True hero. And actually, my favorite character in the whole film, which, you know, that's probably not uncommon. Most people probably have her as their favorite character. Plus, Adrienne Barbeau is awesome. I've actually met Adrienne Barbeau. She's crazy nice. Love her, love her, love her. She's so nice. Um, I like how Father Malone is getting lit during this time, and Castle basically needs to make him stop drinking. He's, like, literally drinking through the, from the bottle. Atkins, Atkins character, Castle, is like, give that to me, and he breaks it. Um, I guess that's how some people cope. You just wouldn't, you wouldn't assume that coming from a priest, that that's how he's coping with it. He's just getting hammered. This one's for Jesus. <laughs> Not really. Uh, the church ends up being the worst place to be if you're trying to get away from this fog, which they find out while they're there. And I love that moment of it where it's kind of like, oh, great. We're in the place that they're probably coming to. And yes, that's where they are. But it's also the best place to be if you're trying to solve the problem. And obviously that happens in the end. So I kind of like the duality of that. It's the worst and best place to be. Stevie on the top of the lighthouse with the two pirates coming at her. Um, is probably the most intense scene in the film, in my opinion, because obviously she has nowhere to go. She cannot do anything. And she's not even protected by anything. Like, the people in the church, like, they have windows that, that, the, that the pirates have to get through first and doors and stuff like that. There are other rooms they can go to. Stevie on the top of this lighthouse is crazy exposed, and especially when you see the two pirates coming from opposite directions, and they're obviously making it onto the roof of that thing. She's in imminent danger, so it is the most intense scene, and I think it looks great the way they shot it from above. Very cool. Uh, and I, <laughs> and I was like, so wait, that that's a giant gold cross? Is that what's going on here? the The giant cross that Father Malone brings out and presents to Blake, the pirate is is a giant gold cross. So I have questions if that's the case. So if that's all gold then it wasn't used to build the church and the town, I assume, because there it is. And then why would you keep it like that? Like, first of all, why would you make it into a cross? It's gold, especially if you're, you were planning on using it at some point. But then why would you just keep it, especially if it's blood money, basically? I don't, like, something about, that just doesn't make sense. But 
if you have some theories, go ahead and put some comments down there. I will. I like theories. Father Malone just had to go because of his lineage in the very end. And you know what? I love that that's how they end the film of him just getting his head lopped out, off. Granted, that's another opportunity for them to, you know, show something. But I also think that it's it's more effective if it's the very last thing you see if they just cut to black. And it's a cool ending because then it's like, oh, you think the pirates are gone. The fog situation's totally handled. Well, not necessarily because they're still around. Um, based off how things went with that giant gold cross, it seemed like they just kind of evaporated and they're not around anymore, but they're still around. That's the thing. So, you know, maybe they have more business somewhere. I don't know. Or maybe just killing Malone was the end of the business. So let's talk about some technical stuff about this. The cinematography is excellent. The directing is great. The scenery and ambiance is amazing. Um, just aesthetically, this is an awesome film. I, I love the aesthetics of this one. The music matches really well, like I already said in the beginning. Shooting locations are excellent. I love movies, movies with coastal town settings. Some of my favorite ones because of the way they made it look and how how much they show of the coastal town. Some of my favorites are humano uh, humanoids from humanoids from the deep or humanoid creatures from the deep. Um, why am I blanking on that? I did a review for it. It's on my channel. And Dead and Buried also did a review for that. It's on my channel. So check those out as well. Um, the dialogue in this is particularly good. I really have to point that out. That occurred to me pretty early on in the film, and it sustains. There's a lot of fun kind of back and forth between characters and just really well-written dialogue in particular. Good. Uh, if you pitch this concept, by the way, it sounds terrible. But they pulled it off. And that's how you know it's a great filmmaker and they have a great crew and great actors. When you can take a concept that if you boil it down and think, what was the pitch for this like? And you're like, that sounds dumb, but the film's really good. That's how you know the people involved are amazing. And that I, I feel like this is it. Because like, who would go pitch this and be like, okay, here's the concept. Coastal town, radio station in a lighthouse. There's a fog with pirates in it. They want to kill people because the town is built with their gold. That's a terrible concept. It's a terrible concept. But they did it. They killed it. It's amazing. Literally, they killed it. Um, this is the age-old story of future generations paying the price for the sins of those before them. Literally in this, like, the sins of the father type thing. Because it is Father Malone's actual lineage that did it. So he ends up paying in the end for the sins of the father, you know. And what happens when the foundation for the future is built on crimes and lies? Eventually... The piper has to be paid, and that's exactly what happens 100 years later in The Fog. Sorry, Antonio Bay. I would like a sequel? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I don't want a sequel. But, um, hey, quite liked it. So, now my rating portion of this. So, out of five stars with half stars in play, it's not the best film. It's not the most amazing film. I really like it, though. I'm going to give it a very solid four stars. I'm between four and four and a half. If I did quarters, I'd do 4.25, but I don't think it's it's quite enough to get it to four and a half. I'm going to put it at the four. I really do like this film. Um, it's a fun time. So put your comments down there, your thoughts on the fog, theories, just feelings, whatever. Um, also just other Carpenter stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Carpenter, as you can tell, because I have a whole playlist on my channel of Carpenter film reviews. And I'll be adding to those at some point, I'm sure. But do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe uh, if you like anything I do, because I'm not making money or anything. Uh, and if you already subscribed, just hit that thumbs up to say, I want to encourage you and I like what you're doing. So thanks everyone for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.